So again, my name is Dennis O'Brien. I'm the Director of Standards and Solutions with GS1 Ireland. I have a very short agenda, you'll be glad to hear. As you can tell, when I step behind this, I'm not going to keep between you and your lunch. Uh, I'll be out there myself. So very briefly today, we'll have an introduction to GS1. I'm not sure if many people here are familiar with who GS1 are and what we do. Generally, they aren't. They know they have to pay us money every now and again, but other than that, they've no idea what we do. So we'll try and change that today. I'll then give you a very brief overview of the different barcodes, what they are, how to use them, where you use them. And then we're trying to surf across a couple of topics, uh, which are the future developments, what direction barcodes are going, um, and what impact it might have both on retailers and on retail solution providers. So just to make you aware of what is actually coming down the tracks in the very immediate future as well as slightly more long term. So we start off very briefly with who are we? Who are GS1? So we're 40 years known as the barcode people. So obviously 40 years ago, the barcode became a commercially viable option. Way before that, the barcode was used and was actually circular and square and oblong. Um, but about 40 years ago, it was standardized into what we now recognize as an EAN 13 type barcode, a linear barcode. But we do a lot more than that. Obviously, we do barcodes and we like to think we specialize in barcodes. We also do EDI and electronic communications. That's not e-commerce, it's electronic communications, which is the exchange of messages, transaction messages, traceability messages, that type of thing. We also um, manage the standards through EPC Global for electronic product code, which is the RFID. So the GS1 Gen 2 tag, EUHF tag now is the, is the de facto standard, I think you would agree, is, um, and that's managed by EPC Global. Um, We'd all, we're a WLOA organization. We love our acronyms. So we've got RFID, GDSN, um, <laughs> all sorts of acronyms. You can count them as we go through the slides. Don't let it put you off. So our GDSN is basically a product information network. We'll touch on that today as well. GS1 source. Uh, we've heard a lot today about mobile commerce, about mobile availability of data for your customers if you're retailers, uh, and we'll, we'll touch on that as well. So where are we? We're actually in 111 offices serving 155 countries worldwide. So we're quite a big organization and we look on it as a global standards. It's not European, certainly not Irish, it's not European, it is global. So everywhere in the world that there's any sort of technology used, we generally have a presence. And we try to represent everybody. So from international regulatory authorities, we do represent government and state agencies, but we also re uh, represent retailers, manufacturers, healthcare providers, logistics providers, distributors, solution providers, um, and we take all of their views into account. I must stress that we're a neutral body and we're not-for-profit. Surprises a lot of people. But we're actually a not-for-profit organization. Again, we don't have a motive to sell you a product. We're not trying to sell you a system or to get you to sign up to any particular uh, framework. The idea is that the standards, it's our mission if you like, and people find it hard to get excited about barcodes, but it's our mission to ensure that if everybody is using the same standards, it will make it much easier and far cheaper for, in, for businesses to communicate with each other. These are some of our Irish members. Most of you are probably members. Anybody in the retail trade, I think 100% of retailers basically scan barcodes. I don't think there's any exceptions that I'm aware of. Um, so there are some of our Irish members. So what do we do? We basically look at our business, if you like, in three different categories, identify, capture, and share. So we have a whole infrastructure on how to identify products, locations, people, services, anything at all we can identify. And the idea is to assign it a globally unique identity. So that if you scan a GS1 barcode, if you read a GS1 RFID tag, uh, or if you receive a GS1 electronic message, that there's no ambiguity about what you're talking about. A global location number is just that. It's globally unique and it identifies a particular location. Not necessarily a physical location, it could be a virtual location. We also cover capturing that data. So whether it's true scanning or whether it's true RFID or whether it's sharing the information using electronic communications. So they're the broad areas that we cover. Again, getting back to the retail focus, we look at the various barcodes. I'd say most of you are probably aware of three of those. I would hazard a guess the EAN or GS113. 
the GS1128 retailers, a lot of retailers will be familiar with, and no doubt the QR code. Everybody knows the QR code because it's used widely in marketing. But we also cover the standard, although ITF14 now is, is an old technology or an old barcode. Uh, it's one of ours as well, the data matrix also, and the data bar. Top center is a data bar barcode. I'll come back to that later on. And where are they used? Just to clarify, not all barcodes are used in all circumstances. A lot of people don't realize that either. So for outer case marking, you have a choice. An ITF14, which simply contains a product ID, nothing else. All you can tell from scanning an ITF14 is what the product is. It does not contain any additional information. Using a GS1128, which was formerly known as the EAN128, you can scan that barcode and it can contain information such as expiry dates, quantities, uh, lot numbers, serial numbers. So there's a lot of additional information that can be added um, to help identify a product. And then with the data matrix, you can also embed a lot of information. So all of the expiry dates, lot numbers, serial numbers, volume, height, width, length, weight, price, all of that information can be embedded in either the GS1128 or the data matrix. The more data you have, the more difficult it is to include in a, car a carrier, data carrier, such as the data matrix or GS1128. So it's important that you look at what information you absolutely need to carry. Transport and logistics, again, it's, you will find ITF14, but very rarely will you find an ITF14 on a pallet card, for example. You're far more likely to find a GS1128 or a data matrix. Data matrix is now up and coming. So again, I would urge if you're developing systems or if you're planning systems that include backdoor scanning or goods receipt or goods dispatch, consider buying scanners, 2D imagers that are capable of scanning both the old linear barcodes and the new 2D barcodes. So the two-dimensional barcodes such as data matrix or QR code, because they are up and coming. That technology is on the way and quite a few companies are using them already. Similarly for point of sale, so anybody providing the point of sale solutions, you'll find now that uh, the GS113 or the EAN13 as it was known is the de facto standard. Almost every product that's produced will have an EAN13 on it. The exception is some of the newer generation of products that are now coming out are likely to have a data bar. Data bar is the new replacement, if you like, for GS113, the old EAN13. You might also find a data matrix on some retail products. This is not strictly approved because there are issues with it, but you'll find it quite often in pharmacy at the retail point of sale. And the reason is that you simply can't carry enough information in the old EAN13. Okay, but you will find a data matrix there. You'll also ask, where's the QR code? Where does that come into this? At the moment, the QR code is not approved for point of sale in retail. It's primarily used for marketing. Extended packaging, as we like to call it, but it's generally used for marketing. Almost invariably, when you scan a QR code, you'll get taken to a website, a web page. But technically, there's nothing to stop you embedding any information you wish, you wish into a QR code or a data matrix. That includes the usual product code, expiry date, batch numbers, serial numbers, length, width, height, breadth, weight, price, anything you wish, can all be embedded in either the QR code or the data matrix. Okay. So, the secret of barcodes. This probably sounds patronizing, I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. The idea of the barcodes is they're data carriers. You'll often hear us refer to them as data carriers. They carry the data. Um, so the idea is the GTIN is effectively the product code. It's the global trade item number. It's just a globally unique number. Every can of Coke contains a unique number, four cans of Coke. Um, so that would be embedded in the barcode, for example. It's quite easy to see the GTIN in a barcode. You'll also see a batch number, for example. So that's a typical combination. Uh, and you'll also see a best before date or a use by date embedded in the barcode as well. There are a few others as well. Uh, this one is, is particularly specific to fish, for example, uh, which is a date of catch, uh, a species code, uh, and the, the production unit or the factory where the fish was processed. So as you can see, the barcodes contain the data. The big difference is that the data matrix can contain it all in a single barcode. So the more information you need to put in, the more flexible the 2D barcodes are. That's just to give you a background to it. Again, just to stress that there are barcode specifications. Most people think if I print a barcode and I get on with Word and I get a font or if I get on with Easy Label and I just print a barcode, uh, and it scans, it, that's it, it's job done. It's not the case. 
The fact that you produce a barcode and it scans is meaningless. And believe me, I know, I'll show you examples of it later on, where you think you're doing a great job, and don't let your marketing people who are doing your packaging decide on the size of your barcode. There are specifications for it. You should follow the specifications as closely as possible and you should have the barcode verified. Because what will scan for you might scan in 90% of the stores that your product ends up in, but will not scan in 10% of the stores. But in those 10% of the stores, depending on who you end up with, it could cost you significantly. So a lot of the large retailers will actually fine you if your product doesn't scan correctly because they're fed up losing sales for product that won't scan or for holdups at the checkout while they key in barcode numbers, which they shouldn't have to do. So just be aware there is a specification and it's there for a good reason. Okay, so we look at some barcodes. The good, for example, both of those barcodes are perfectly adequate. They're printed very well, they're very clear, but unfortunately one scans and one doesn't. The one on the bottom hasn't left a margin to the right hand side, so it won't scan the scanner can't pick up the edge of the barcode. Again, some scanners might, a lot of scanners won't. So we've had the good, we look at the bad. And I know everyone's gonna look at this and say, well, it's bleeding obvious, isn't it? You can see the quality of the barcode, but we get these every day of the week. We get this sort of uh, barcode quality issue coming up every day of the week and it causes problems because it means that the systems that are used for scanning the barcodes are just not as efficient as they should be. We also get the downright ugly. It's hard to believe you would still get some of these barcodes here. There are some fundamental uh, deficiencies in the barcodes, but people still produce them and don't realize, if they're not scanning them out of their premises, they don't realize the grief it causes somebody else further down the supply chain. So just to make them aware of that as well. So I'll come back to data bar. The reason I'm highlighting data bar today is because it's the new generation of barcode. If you're in retail, you're going to come across it. Many of you probably have already. It's particularly in fruit and veg. But in food, you'll certainly come across the data bar increasingly. We are, as was said earlier, we're actually a bit behind the curve compared to the rest of Europe. So we're going to have play catch up now. So what is the data bar? It's a Swiss Army knife of barcodes. It's new technology, it's a new methodology of barcoding. It's also designed to be backwards compatible. So the existing point of sale scanning, software, scanning hardware that you have should be perfectly capable of reading the data bar. Even though it's a stacked, you can have two or three elements in a barcode and it's stacked, your existing hardware should be capable of scanning it. All you should have to do is switch on that function and then obviously make sure that your software can process the barcode when it gets it. You'll also find there are a variety of different types of the data bar. And this is what makes it more flexible, it makes it more special if you like. So what can it do? Bog standard product identification. We've extended it to 14 digits instead of 13. That adds 27 billion further inter iterations, I think some mathematician will tell me. But if you add a 14 digit, it gives me billions of extra product codes if you like. Um, in terms of containing the same data, it's 50% smaller. It needs a 50% smaller footprint and still scans reliably. There's another version of it where you can actually manipulate the size and shape of the barcode. You can have it longer and sh shorter, or you can have it taller and narrower. So you can manipulate the size and shape for printing on curved surfaces or very small items. Um, it's also, as I said, backward compatible. So your existing hardware should scan it. Uh, and should be presented to your software as a string of text. It can carry uh, the GS1128 application identifiers. These are the fields of data such as use by dates, serial numbers, price, weight, uh, any of those various fields can be embedded in the data bar. The more information you put in, the bigger the data bar barcode will get. And there are common combinations such as, for example, the product identification and the um, best before date or the, the lot number, and they're optimized, so they, they actually fit in, they're quite compressed. There's also a further edition of it, which is using reduced space symbology, and this is the same family of, of um, barcodes, and that gives you the best of both worlds. So for example, to fit in a number of fields, so for fish traceability, for example, there are approximately 13 fields of data um, that are required by law, or 
well, they're already required by law, but most fish producers aren't doing it, but they will be from next year. So there are 13 fields that are required. Uh, using a reduced space symbology, they can fit all of those fields into one barcode. It makes life so much easier. So that particular barcode is the best of both worlds. The linear section at the bottom will scan on your existing hardware, and you'll still identify it as a product. And you'll see that the series of dots above it, they're a series of very small linear barcodes. So your existing hardware might be able to scan it, but it will contain a lot more information. It's just more condensed or more compressed. So that's just giving you an overview of DataBar. So as I said, reduced footprint. It's the planned successor to your GTIN 8, 12, 13, or 14. There's an EAN 8, an EAN 13. The 12 digit is UPC, and there's also a 14 digit GTIN. Okay, so that's what your EAN 13 looks like. That's what your data bar looks like for the equivalent, or you can reduce the size further. And as I say, there's the composite data bar as well, same family, but you can fit a lot more information into it. So what does that mean for you? Well, I'm presuming our audience has either retailers or retail solution providers. So the main thing for data bar is all normal functionality is preserved. So with a very minor software tweak, you should be able to do exactly the same as you do at the moment, scan a data bar, process the product, identify the product, and process it as normal. If the data is embedded in the barcode, you should be able to read both prices and weights. One of the big disadvantages at the moment is you can only read the price, or you can only read the weight. And that doesn't necessarily give you an insight for sales analysis as to what price or what weight a product was sold at. Um, it also gives you the ability to read the expiry dates. So if the expiry date is in the barcode, your point of sale system should be able to prevent the sale of out-of-date product. And that can be quite embarrassing for a retailer to find somebody leaves the store with an out-of-date product. And then they come back to you two days later. You've no way of knowing whether they bought that product two weeks previously and did a swap, or whether they genuinely left the store with a product that was already out-of-date, and you can't argue. With this, you can argue because the date of uh, expiry can actually be in the barcode they won't be let leave the store. You can also use a true GTIN, a true global trade um, item number, so the full 13 or 14 digit number to identify the product. In variable weight or variable price at the moment, you're generally using a three or four digit PLU number, which means if you're producing a pack of apples, for example, uh, but the price is based on weight, maybe apple is not a good example, but if you're using a product as variable weight or variable price, uh, and you're producing it for one of the retailers, you have to label it with a particular PLU for that retailer. If you're then labeling exactly the same product for a different retailer, they will have a different PLU number for that because it's limited to four of three or four digits. A full GTIN will enable you to label the product regardless of the retailer because it's a unique 14 digit number. It will not be confused with any other product. Also, you can read and record supplier batch numbers, lot numbers or serial numbers if they're embedded in the barcode. And that enables the stores to maintain live stock <coughs> levels. As they do in electronics, they can go in and tell you how many 55-inch LCD TVs they have in stock, how many cookers of a particular brand, make and model that they have in stock. There is no reason in retail why they can't tell you how many products are approaching their shelf life. Do you put them on promotion? Do you get rid of them? So it can be done now based on expiry dates or batch codes. Similarly, if the batch code is in it, you can actually prevent the sale of recalled items. Put it into your point of sale system. Do not sell product code X with batch number Y. Even if you miss it when you're taking it off the shelves, your point of sale system should be able to prevent the sale of it. So that's the data bar. I'm going to touch briefly, um, don't get frightened, I'm just going to touch very briefly on the food information regulation and the impact it will have uh, on retailers and retail solution providers. I presume most of you are aware of the food information regulation that comes into effect in December 2014, um, so I won't go into too much detail on it, but it's going to affect primarily online selling. It directly affects packaging of retail products because it's for the first time it's going to specify things like font sizes, the allergens and the ingredients that must be included on the packaging, and that's going to change packaging. So chances are every one of you, if you're producing, although I think we're in the retail market, but if you're producing for retailers, all of your packaging is going to have to change over the next 12 months. And just to be aware of that. Uh, similarly with online, you will not be allowed to sell online without providing this information in advance. So it's now part of the law. 
So that's obviously it's advisable if you're going to put product information up on an online website you want to sell online, where do you get that information? So obviously you need to have a close relationship with your supplier or with the brand owner or manufacturer. As we've seen earlier, uh, everybody is, is saying mobile is the up and coming uh, entity in business now. Everybody's going mobile. Even if they're buying in your store, they're checking out many of their products online, even while they're standing in your store. So obviously this has to be important to you because it's important to your customers. I'm sure most of you have seen this. Have you? So I think that just proves mobile is here to stay. <laughs> Even if we don't use it, the generation behind us is certainly using it. There's no question about that. Also, to reinforce what other people have said, it's just the mobile commerce is growing. There's no doubt whatsoever about that. Even in Ireland alone, 71% of the population have smartphones. So exclude people at the upper end of the age bracket who probably don't, and very young kids who don't have them yet. Um, it's a hell of a coverage of smartphones. Tablets, 41% of the population now have them, and this is 2012 figures, and 2.225 million members on Facebook. You can't join Facebook until you're 13 years of age, so it's quite high coverage. But, having said that, and everybody is very positive about mo mobile commerce, the use of mobile technology, there's a major problem, and it's a bit like the elephant in the room that nobody is addressing. That's the quality of the data. I'll give you some statistics later on, very briefly. But for example, if I scan a bottle of Coke, quite often it'll bring up no details whatsoever. Or because a lot of the information is based on crowdsourcing, so the various apps are trawling the web looking for things like ingredients, for nutritional information, for reviews of the product. It's subject to manipulation. So you'll find, for example, when I scan a bottle of Coke, I'm getting an ad for Pepsi, okay? Because it's manipulative. Sometimes no information at all. It's quite clear if you're scanning and you scan a product on your app and there's no information on it, you're more likely to move on to another product. You are certainly less likely to buy that product. Even worse, if it's the wrong product, it doesn't matter which of those two screens are wrong, whether it's the actual item has the wrong barcode or whether the app is reporting the wrong item. There's now confusion the consumer is gonna move on. They've lost trust in either the app or in the product. So how bad is it? The mobile savvy shopper in GS1 UK recently showed that 91% of mobile barcode scans returned incorrect product descriptions. 91% of scans had incorrect information. That's a major problem. And it is probably one of the major stoppages or barriers to adoption of mobile commerce. Even though it's growing and growing very rapidly, there's obviously a limit to what people will use. And people will con not continue to use it if they can't trust the data on it. Some of the apps, for example, that are described, such as checking for allergens, um, putting in preferences, that if you, if you don't want to use products that aren't farmed ethically, that aren't produced ethically, if you don't trust the data, you can't rely on those apps, and there's a barrier to the adoption of those apps, which can be very powerful. 75% of scans returned no product information at all, and 87% returned no image. Okay, so just bare statistics. So again, what's the solution? Uh, GS1 have developed a framework. This is not a product, I stress, because everyone thinks we're selling a product. This is not a product. It's a framework. It's a set of standards so that if you publish your data as a brand owner, that you give everybody equal access to it in a standard way. It accelerates adoption, and it makes it much easier and much cheaper to get this information to the consumer. The difficulty at the moment is that every retailer seems to think that standards are a great idea. They like them so much they adopt their own every time. It's absolutely important that if you're going to publish your data, that you make it available to everybody. It will just drive adoption and make life a lot easier. 
Now, as I say, it's not a product. This is a set of standards. It's a bit like the, the internet, the building of websites or the building of web pages. It's a means for various databases to communicate with each other and for application developers to get information that they can trust. There are so many apps out there that are trawling websites looking for data on products. Now, as a brand owner, you certainly don't want that. As a, a, an online e-tailer, you certainly don't want that. Because if you put up that a product has 300 calories, and actually it has six, seven, 800 calories, you lose your reputation overnight. So quicker than I can tweet it, or quicker than I can put up a Facebook post, your reputation is gone in that field. So it's absolutely important that you've got a trusted source of data. And that is a direct link back to the brand owner. So the only person who can alter or amend the data would be the brand owner or an authorized party on behalf of the brand owner. Okay, so that's the GS1 source. If you're building your mobile apps, if you're looking at your mobile apps or that environment, consider using the standards and consider your source of the data. And when you're starting, your source of the data is the supplier, your main supplier. But think in the future, you're gonna have many, many suppliers that you do not necessarily have direct contact with or direct control over. So it will make your life a lot easier in the long run if everybody's using the same standard. And that standard, we like our acronyms, GDSN. I hate it, but Global Data Synchronization Network. We call it the Product Information Network. The idea is that you're able to publish your data into a central series of databases. Technically, it's a whole series of databases worldwide. But you can publish your data into a central database and decide who has access to that data. But only you as a brand owner can change the data. You're responsible for it. At the moment, very briefly, we look at what happens. So a manufacturer or a brand owner, they want to deal with distributors and shops. What do they have to do? They send out product specifications. You've all got listings for getting your products listed. The product specification goes out, then the goods are delivered. Okay? The distributor quite often does exactly the same. They send out a version of the product specification to their customers. And what happens? Okay, distributor A sent out the wrong information. Laziness, lack of time, don't understand the implications of it. So you now have our first shop there selling product based on the wrong information. Harmless enough if it's only the size, the color, the make, the brand, it, it's, it's not a big deal or if there's a spelling mistake in it. But if you've left out the fact there's a nuts in the ingredients, one, you could be at serious risk from a due, due diligence point of view, uh, but two, you're losing credibility. And now, as of December 2014, you'll be breaking the law. Remember, whoever's selling the product is responsible for the data that, that must be on the product or that's displayed about the product. Similarly, in our second shop, they get two product specification sheets from two different suppliers and they don't match. So which one do they use? They don't know major issue. The third scenario obviously is our last shop doesn't get any product specification sheet, they just put the product up on their website, put it on their shelf, they, they don't know anything about it. That will no longer be allowed either. You must have the product information available for the consumer before you sell it. The other difficulty you're going to have is when you're sending out these product specifications, each of your customers or your distributors wants it in a different format. Some want CSV, some want text, some want uh, various formats. Excel spreadsheets is a fairly common one. So you're now sending out four, five, six different versions of your product specification sheet. And quite often you can have someone employed full time just generating these various specs. So where does GDSN come into that? GDSN is a series of database. Remember, it's, it's not a product, it's a service, and it's a means of interoperability. So you send your product spec once, and anybody who requires it, and that you give permission, can then get a copy of it. If for any reason you have to change it, either to correct it or to amend it because of recipe changes, for example, anybody who's got a copy of it previously is automatically notified of the changes. You don't have to concern yourself with it. And now to touch briefly on, we love our acronyms, NGPI, Next Generation Product Identification. Again, I have two slides left so you can relax. It's just to show you what's happening or what the trend is on product identification. Uh, everybody's familiar with the old EAN 13 or GS1 13 and it contains the GTIN, the global trade item number. It's just a unique number for each product. The problem is every time the product changes, even slightly, the number has to change. 
you have to go through the whole process of getting the product listed, getting the price set up, going through the whole rigmarole of backwards and forwards, setting up new product specifications. It's a nightmare and it's very costly. So the next stage will be where you get a product variant number. So certain fields can change on a product that will not impact on the actual product identity. It might be only a slight change, it might be a packaging, packaging change, and instead of having to relist the entire product, you just need to give it a variant add-on. So the idea will be that you'll identify the product plus its variant. You might also, for example, uh, embed the product, a variant and or an expiry date, a lot number or a serial number. The idea being, for example, that if you've got a particular lot or batch number, that the specific ingredients for that product might be slightly different than the ingredients for a previous product of exactly the same quality, the same makeup, but the recipe could be slightly different. You'll have product substitution. So the idea is to enable you to manage that. And again, product variant number, what's it used for? You can see there the manufacturers, the retailers, the consumers in, in particular always benefit from it. And that's the way the, the next generation product identification is going. And again, it'll be done with either data bar or data matrix or QR code. You'll be glad to hear that concludes my contribution. Thank you.